Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I welcome all of you to another CPD webinar organized by the Sri Knowledge Academy. Uh, before joining in the lecture, uh, let's go to some housekeeping rules. Yes, uh, the today the webinar link will be available uh, from uh, until 9.45 a.m. for you to join. So please join before that. No late attendees will be permitted. And uh, you have to attend until the very end of the lecture to obtain the CPD certificate. If uh, any failure of uh, attending occurred, so let's say due to a power cut or an internet issue, please let us know. There's a uh, number in the chat box. Uh, so we will attend to that. And uh, you have to attend until the very end uh, to obtain the CPD uh, certificate. So going back to today's lecture, uh, it is uh, the topic is approach towards achieving asthma controlling children. And uh, today uh, the lecturer is uh, Dr. Channa De Silva. Uh, let me give a brief introduction about him. He's the proud product of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And he's the very first pediatric pharmacologist in Sri Lanka. So he's a pioneer in the field of pharmacology in the aspect of pediatrics in Sri Lanka. Dear sir, thank you very much uh, for uh, sh uh, sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, and please do uh, share your knowledge with us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Sri team for inviting me to discuss about pediatric asthma while the world is celebrating the World Asthma Day. Each year, the first Tuesday of each uh, May is uh, considered as the World Asthma Day. And this is declared by the GINA, the Global Initiative to Asthma. As you all know, it's a WHO collaborative institute, mainly uh, established to improve the awareness about asthma. And they have declared this World Asthma Day. It's mainly to improve the awareness of asthma. And that the final aim means to uh, improve the asthma control and reduce the suffering from asthma in patients throughout the world. Um, so in children also it's very important asthma is one of the important disease the most commonest uh, chronic disease in childhood each year the gina uh, introduces a separate uh, theme for asthma day and this year the theme is asthma care for all as you all know uh, throughout the world still there are many many people children as well as adults suffering from asthma without proper treatment due to various reasons and even uh, especially we consider children even they are require or even they uh, on treatment still the asthma control is very poor in majority of patients there are various reasons for that and some of these reasons actually the majority of these reasons very um, simply very uh, we can manage and we can correct these things so the asthma control is one of the important thing when we discussing about asthma as you all know uh, asthma is the commonest chronic disease in children it's not only the commonest chronic respiratory disease it's called the commonest chronic disease in childhood uh, about one third of children preschool age children uh, show increasing symptoms at least once in their lifetime and out of those they continue another one third of this one third will continue as asthma uh, all as we all know the understanding about asthma management options the very sophisticated diagnostics techniques are developed throughout the world uh, over the last few decades but still not only sri lanka asthma control is a major issue because still we see various people various children and adults suffering from asthma frequent hospital admissions due to recurrent uh, asthma attacks as well as there are still deaths are reported. So asthma control is one of the main important topic we have to discuss while the world is celebrating the World Asthma Day and while the world is focusing about asthma care for all. So management of asthma is a challenge. So then today we discuss how do we approach towards achieving the asthma control in children. What are the main steps we should follow to control or achieve control? In asthma. First thing is, I am discussing this in few steps. When to achieve asthma control, the first thing is we have to have a correct diagnosis. So it's very important to diagnose asthma first before or uh, treating the asthma. So first thing is, before diagnosis, we should have some idea about what is asthma. And then we should have some idea how do we diagnose and how do we confirm the diagnosis of asthma. What is asthma? Uh, various definitions are there regarding asthma. Obviously, none of these definitions are complete or very, no, they are not simple definitions. There are no simple single sentence definitions. But currently, we follow the GINA definitions. According to GINA, asthma is a heterogeneous disease 
usually characterized by chronic cavity inflammation and it is defined by the presence of respiratory symptoms such as cough, wheezing, shortness of breath and chest tightness that vary over time and intensities together with variable expiratory air flow limitation. And air flow limitations may become persistent if we do not treat it properly. It's a little bit a complex uh, definition, but we'll see what are the important points in this um, definitions because it's a clinical pathophysiological as well as pathological explanation or descriptions what is going on asthma and that is came as a definitions because there are various conditions which can mimic asthma which can give rise to similar symptoms so that's why it's very difficult to give a single sentence sentence very clear definition for asthma so what are the important points in these definitions first thing is it's a heterogeneous disease we'll come to that in a while and obviously associated with chronic cavity inflammation and sometimes we know now the world is going towards identifying more about the pathophysiology of asthma sometimes some kids especially can have asthma very even the proportion would be minor without chronic cavity inflammation but basically most of the time there's a chronic cavity inflammation and persons of respiratory symptoms there are four core clinical symptoms cough wheezing shortness of breath and chest tightness none of these symptoms are unique to asthma any respiratory disease can lead to these symptoms but we'll see how these symptoms are important for the diagnosis of asthma another important thing is asthma the symptoms are vary over time and intensity and this variability due to variable expiratory airflow limitation that's the main problem because of this air inflammatory changes in the airway airway lumen get narrowed so because of that uh, we have problem in inspiration as well as expirations but the major problem is in the expiration so there is a expiratory air flow limitation and if we do not treat it properly the air flow limitations may be become persistent that is called remotely so when we discuss about asthma the definition or the description the word the term asthma actually it's just an umbrella term like uh, to describe uh, those describe the syndrome of cough, wheezing, chest tightness and shortness of breath. It's almost similar as anemia or arthritis. So we call anemia because of when the patient is having low hemoglobin, arthritis when there's a hot, red, painful joints. We know anemia is not a simple single disease. We know arthritis is not a simple single disease. The asthma, the definition or the, the description of asthma is also the same. It is just an umbrella term we describe cough, wheezing, chest tightness and a shortness of breath. So we know under the umbrella of anemia, there are different kinds of anemia. Under the umbrella of arthritis, there are different kinds of arthritis. The pathophysiology and the clinical presentations all are different from uh, osteoarthritis, from uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Like asthma, it's not a simple single disease. So there are underlying different pro disease processes that are called the endotypes. Endotypes are distinct pathophysiological mechanisms. Uh, now at the moment, we have identified two types of mechanisms in, in all in the TH type 2 and non-TH type 2. And there are variable phenotypes. Phenotypes are the variable clinical presentations. So important thing is asthma is a heterogeneous disease. It's not a single disease. There are different types of diseases under these terms umbrella with different pathophysiological processes so endotypes plus different phenotypes so if we diagnose asthma in a child so diagnosis of asthma is not the end of the diagnostic journey they, that is actually the start of the diagnostic journey and we should dig into more we should assess which asthma does this child have we'll try to discuss a little bit in um later Okay, so how do we diagnose asthma? To diagnose asthma, there should be clinical symptoms. As I mentioned earlier, there are four core clinical symptoms of asthma, cough, wheezing, breathlessness, and chest tightness. Uh, I'm not going to details about this. Uh, the So important thing is the pattern of these symptoms, how this cough varies. We know in asthma, it's mainly dry cough and wheezing is there. Sometimes they feel breathing difficulty, plus older children and adults might a complete chest tightness because of this expiratory air flow limitations they cannot breathe in so because of that they feel their chest are very tight so how do we diagnose this how do we identify this pattern 
the change of these symptoms, the variability of symptoms, uh, the pattern of variability and the intensity of variability is important. And this variability would be according to time of the day. And also the symptoms worse at night or early morning and usually mild improvement during the daytime and associated with triggers. That is one of the classical thing in patients with asthma with exposure to triggers, the symptoms get a little worse. And plus, as this is an atopic disease, as for most of the patients, uh, there might be a history of personal history or family history of allergic rhinitis, eczema. So other important thing is responsive controller treatment and uh, real uh, recurrent symptoms when if we uh, or stop this uh, medication so these are the main points that we consider to diagnose asthma i'm not going to details of the diagnostic diagnosis of asthma as you all know these things just to recap but other important thing i want to stress is there are other conditions which can give rise to similar kind of symptoms wheezing breathing difficulty cough or chest tightness but obviously might not asthma initial presentation might be asthma or sometimes uh, in, in initial there might be little response to bronchodilatages as well but they might present again and again so that is a part of a child with uncontrolled asthma so actually that is not asthma so that's why it's very important the diagnosis is important uh, first before going into the rest of the management so there are a lot of asthma mimics sometimes maybe airway abnormally like tracheomalacia or bronchomalacia sometimes congenital heart disease recurrent viral infection sometimes viruses can induce wheezing symptoms without having true allergy mediated asthma sometimes it may be due to recurrent aspirations structural abnormalities like vascular ring can cause obstruction of the airway can lead to expiratory airflow limitation and wheezing symptoms like asthma mimicking asthma other conditions bronchopalmal dysplasia bronchiolitis obliterans cystic fibrosis primary serial dyskinesia or even for in body aspiration obstructing the airway can uh, uh, if there is an um, unwitnessed for in body aspiration especially in children they might not tell uh, the clinical presentation might be similar as asthma so it is very important to have some idea about these possible underlying asthma mimics and for that these red flag signs are important Asthma is not a disease which causes significant severe failure to try. Asthma is not a disease causing significant uh, uh, chest wall deformities. It's not a disease causing uh, persistent uh, um, purulent uh, uh, mucus production. And it is not a disease causing clubbing. So if you see any of these features, so then the asthma diagnosis per se is unlikely. Persistent moist cough, isolated cough without evidence of wheezing symptoms. And the starting since early infancy, early infancy, the beginning of the symptoms in the early infancy means possible some structural airway abnormality rather than uh, allergic induced asthma disease. Severe failure to thrive, strido, finger clubbing, obviously pointing towards possible superior to lung disease, or maybe bronchiectasis, maybe cystic fibrosis, significant chest deformities, suggestive of possible uh, a structural abnormality like that. So it's very important to identify these red flag signs before starting treatment of as asthma. Obviously, uh, uh, the, the response to treatment would be poor. I just quickly go through some of the examples which I claim because real life scenarios which manage as asthma, uncontrolled symptoms, and with the further evidence, be the investigations reveal something else in the diagnosis. The first case is three year old girl with recurrent severe wheezing episodes and even required PCU admissions, required ventilation, but with the intubation, child conditions quickly improve. So uh, uh, bronchoscopy revealed there's a narrowing of the mid-trachea. And you can see the CT, there's a cystic uh, lesions which causing obstruction to trachea. That was the reason the child presented with asthma-like symptoms. That was a bronchogenic cyst. And this child's so-called asthma has been cured with the surgery. Uh, which remove this bronchogenic uh, cyst. Another six month old girl, persistent wheezing and cough, poor response to uh, bronchodilator and steroids, initially managed as asthma like symptoms. You can see the bronchoscopy. Uh, we saw uh, there's a narrowing in the mid trachea again, and the CT revealed the vascular ring. Uh, this vascular ring almost completely inserted in the mid trachea, causing some obstructions leading to asthma like symptoms 11 month old baby presented with trachypnea and wheezing for two months usually there's a history in the, uh, only two months but there's no previous history of wheezing almost asthma like symptoms wheezing symptoms and the x-ray revealed hyperimpression of the right uh, lung with the medial stern shift to the left side and ct also confirmed hyperimpression of the right side 
uh, and bronchoscopy revealed there's a foreign body. Some food particle lodged in the right main bronchus causing bowel valve effect and uh, hyperimplantation of the right sides leading to wheezing like symptoms. Obviously, this child's asthma, so called asthma, has been cured with bronchoscopic removal of this foreign body. So, all these things are mimics of asthma. And a one year old boy, recurrent and persistent wheezing, despite adequate management, again, same symptoms, uh, bronchoscopy reveals subglottic narrowing. Which you can see, uh, there are two bulging just uh, below the uh, glottic area in the trachea. And so you can compare with the normal trachea. It's the right side, it's a normal trachea. Uh, and you can compare with this thing. Yes, so this actually some hemangioma, hemangioma causing a obstruction to the airway. Uh, this asthma, so called asthma, has been cured with propanolol. You know, propanolol usually is contraindicated, or we are giving a little cautious. Uh, beta blockers in real asthma, but this child's so called asthma has been cured with uh, propanolol because propanolol reduced decre decrease, leading to shrinking of this hemangioma, and finally, conditions has improved like that. And final case with six month old boy, recurrent and persistent wheezing episodes again, same as asthma symptoms, but persistent symptoms despite adequate management and inhalers. Uh, finally, bronchoscopy reveal significant tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia. You can see the collapsed trachea and bronchi. Uh, with compare, uh, if you can, uh, you can compare with the normal uh, trachea, the picture which is in your right side. So, like that, there are possible cases. Obviously, these cases might be very rare, but still, even in once in your lifetime, if you uh, identify one patient and refer to the further investigations that would be life-saving not only uh, it's improve the asthma care but it could be life-saving so it is very important to always keep on mind there might be asthma mimics especially small children initial clinical percentage is same as asthma but the underlying problem would be completely different curable thing okay so when the we diagnosis asthma the uh, it's as is most of the time it's a clinical diagnosis if the classical uh, classical symptoms are there, uh, typical symptoms, variability, and the recurrent symptoms as family history, the probability is very high. It's becoming asthma, and some features are there, but not all the typical features. Then the intermediate probability of uh, being asthma clinically, if the child have these red flag signs, the probability of being asthma is very low. So that's a way that we approach in the initial assessment of asthma. As much as possible, we should be able to diagnose the asthma clinically correctly since the beginning. So once we diagnose it clinically, it's better to uh, do a confirmatory test. Sometimes practical setups might not be possible as much as possible, as much as possible. If you want to start long-term treatment before starting long-term treatment, better to do a confirmatory test appropriate pulmonary function test so the spirometry is the uh, the commonest available widely available pulmonary function test i'm not going to details about spirometry but just to recap uh, the we can do the bronchodilator reversibility test with the bronchodilator reversibility uh, if the uh, if we v1 the increment of if v1 more than 12 percent of the predicted value that is diagnostic of asthma it's confirm your diagnosis but obviously negative test this not exclude asthma, but positive tests obviously confirm the diagnosis. There are other tests also, the peak flow measurements we can use. Practically, we have to at least we have to uh, use it uh, continuously at least for two weeks, and we can get the, the variability morning and the evening variability value. And with that, we can do some calculations. If this dynal variability is more than 13%, according to Gina, that is also diagnostic of asthma, it is confirmatory of dynal variation. In addition, there are some other tests. Uh, it's available like impulse oscillometry, infant VFT, plethysmographic investigations. Some of these are still in the research level, not in the practical settings, but still there are some investigations available if you really want to confirm diagnosis. But clinical diagnosis is the most important thing. Okay, so as we mentioned, the first thing is the diagnosis. Once you or correct, have a correct diagnosis and exclusion of possible asthma mimics. Once you approve, once you diagnose things, so that now the world is going in towards the identification of possible phenotypes. Obviously, these phenotypes are not well defined yet, but actually, is we should have some idea uh, that children have different types of asthma. It's not a single disease. 
as much as possible if we can identify the possible phenotype of these children that is also important for the management as well as to predict their future attacks as well as the prognosis when this child get rid of this asthma natural history all these things are it's important if you can have some idea about the possible phenotype of this child okay so what is a what is a phenotype as i mentioned earlier the asthma the definition or the the uh, description of asthma the term asthma is a syndrome uh, which describe various um, uh, uh, diseases which comes with the uh, cough, breathing difficulty and chest tightness due to variable expiratory airflow limitations. But with that, there are various types of factors, maybe genetical background, exposure, triggers, all these things are variable in children. That's why its disease is also variable. So because of that, there are different types of asthma phenotypes also we can see in children. Uh, there are various types of descriptions with some studies, especially long-term birth course studies. They have identified the initial, there are some description about uh, very old description, 1995. Transient early onset bees, persistent bees, or late onset bees. Now these are a little out now. Like that, the initial studies or the people uh, try to identify possible different types of asthma in children. For example, if it is a, just a transient bees, it settles after three years of age. Obviously, this is just a retrospective thing, but again, it's important to have some idea to uh, with the, these uh, different types of asthma phenotypes are persisting. Other thing is preschool visas. They have initial described two types of visas. Type this is important to have still, uh, although this is not the exact complete description, but just to have some idea. In preschool children, there are two types of visas. Are they are basically the majority: episodic viral visas and multiple trigger visas. Episodic viral visas are the children's preschoolers develop VC symptoms when they develop a viral upper respiratory tract infections. With that, their presence with VC might require nebulization and the rest of the asthma management, or even they can have very severe episodes. However, in between these episodes, they are well. They do not. Uh, develop uh, symptoms according to the uh, various allergies, exposure to triggers, but the main trigger is the viral respiratory tract infections and in between, till they acquire another infections, they are well. Those are the episodic viral visas and there's another group, multiple trigger visas. This group, they develop the symptoms with viral infections as well as in between when they expose to various types of allergens that with triggers. So those are the group they actually have some allergic asthma or the true asthma, real asthma, which might progress to later childhood as well, or even as uh, continue as adulthood asthma. And these patients usually have other atopic diseases as well as family history of atopic diseases. Uh, however, there are some concerns about these definitions, and there are more uh, uh, phenotypes, not only the simple two uh, the, uh, categories, but still these definitions and these descriptions are important right like that so these yeah, these other thing is important thing is these uh, sometimes these phenotypes varies with time so I, i'm not going to the details okay so phenotypes uh, we can uh, assess according to the frequency and severity of symptoms uh, from mild to severe and then episodic to continuous and with that we have mild continuous means in mild episodic means Episodic severe V's and the severe continuous V's. As you all familiar, we saw the initial uh, description used earlier, but now this is also um, out now. We see in many old uh, clinic books uh, description mild persistent asthma, moderate persistent asthma, severe asthma like uh, definitions or diagnosis are there, categorization is there, but now this is also out. So at the moment, there's no accepted comprehensive classification of asthma phenotypes in children yet. Uh, Gina, calling Gina, they have described several, uh, several phenotypes, allergic asthma, non-allergic asthma. Allergic asthma is the, the classic IgE-mediated type and hypersensory related asthma. Non-allergic asthma, sometimes there might be neutrophilic-mediated asthma, adult onset asthma, asthma with persistent airflow limitations, so obesity-induced asthma. These are the phenotypes currently identified by Gina. Other thing is with the etiology, why is that? Because there are various types of things which finally lead into the final shape up of asthma. Maybe infections, genetics, other things, microbiome, environment, treatment factors, all these things are important. That's why different children have different types of asthma. So asthma is a genetic and environment factors are unique 
each children. So your asthma would be completely different from my asthma because my genetics and my exposures are would be completely different from your genetics and your exposure. So it's a heterogeneous condition. So because of that, the important thing I want to stress is while in the management, so we need an individual approach, individual approach. Each child is unique. That's why, but per, fortunately, fortunately, majority of these children, they respond to our routine management. More majority of them respond to inhaled corticosteroids. But still, especially when they have patients with uncontrolled asthma, so you have to dig into the details to identify what is the possibility of these uncontrolled symptoms because the factors would be unique. That child asthma would be completely different from a, a child with completely uh, controlled asthma. So individualized approach is important in the management of asthma in children. <clears throat> yes, then uh, the next step. So we are discussing how to achieve asthma control in children. First, you should diagnose asthma properly. You have to exclude the mimics as well as the, you have to identify possible red flag signs to uh, get that component out to get the true asthma patients. Second thing, if possible, to identify the asthma phenotypes. If possible, that is also important to achieve the asthma control, plan the management, and assess the possible prognosis. And obviously, the asthma control is achieved mainly through the pharmacological management. So then, what are the things we can use? Uh, as you all know, the aim of management, the goal of this pharmacological management is the first thing is to obviously control symptoms. And when we are dealing with children, uh, we have to allow them to have their normal life without undue restrictions. They are very active group, children are active group. They need playing, exercise, other activities. So allow them to have normal activities as well as their lungs are growing, their lung functions are improving. So we have to maintain their lung functions as normal as possible. And most importantly, prevent fixed air for obstructions, fixed air for changes. All that is a reversible disease. If we don't treat it properly, sometimes these changes might persist and lead into some permanent changes that is called fixed air flow limitation. So we have to prevent developing that as well. And obviously, we have to prevent while achieving all these things, while achieving the control, we have to prevent further exacerbations, future exacerbations, especially with requiring hospital admissions. And the final thing is while achieving all these things with the pharmacological management, it's important to reduce avoid or minimize the adverse effects so these are the main goals of treatment of asthma that's why we are using special methods like inhalers to prevent or reduce the uh, side effects of asthma so for that we are using this according to gina this stepwise approach it's not a single uh, thing single encounter it's a process because we don't know which asthma this child is having uh, especially the severity classification is most of the times retrospective thing at the moment, straight away, we cannot say this child, what is the type of asthma, what is the severity of asthma. So it's, uh, con it's a continuous process. That's why they have introduced this cycle. It's a control-based management. We adjust the treatment according to the control. For that, we have to assess properly, we have to adjust treatment, and we have to review the response, again assess, again adjust. So this cycle will continue. That's why it's important. It's a dynamic process. We might have to reduce the dose, increase the dose, we have to address the risk factors, all these things. It's a dynamic process. So it's a and it's stepwise approach with regular follow-up and adjustments of treatment plans. So because of that, we are using this stepwise approach to minimize the side effects, minimize the use of drugs and maximize the asthma control for that we use the stepwise approach uh, there are the methods to identify which step the child is on i'm going to details to identify itself depending on the frequency and the severity of symptoms we judge this child would fit into this step and according to the step we start treatment step one is mainly uh we are giving the as the short acting beta agonist but now since 2019, the management of step one also has been changed dramatically. It's not only giving beta 2 agonists or salbutamol containing drugs because asthma is an inflammatory disease. So because of that, if the child presents with symptoms, that means child is having some inflammation. So just giving bronchodilated would not be enough because that might lead into uh, future significant exacerbation. So we have to tackle the airway inflammation as well for that we have to use some anti-inflammatory medication so because of that the gina recommends use 
inhale corticoid switch since uh, step one. But step one, the change is we are using as required uh, low dose inhale corticoid switch. But our setup this is little still not practicing. One thing is this inhalers are expensive. We have to get inhalers as well as spacers. But majority of time. When we encounter a child with some wheezing symptoms, asthma symptoms, we use oral steroids. Practically, we use, but actually, that is not the best way. If we can manage with inhaled steroids, that's a bit method because that obviously, you know, uh, the dose we are using with inhaled steroids are very, very, very minimum. And with the uh, steps going on, that means the symptoms are uncontrolled, we can uh, increase the inhaled corticosteroid dose, plus, we can add. Maybe long acting beta agonist or leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist like Montelukast, or when this is going for step four and five, with some further investigations, we have to escalate treatment. But majority of children in our setup are belong within the first three uh, steps we can manage without going into step four and four five further assessment. So, as I mentioned, the commencing long-term treatment depending on the, the frequency and the severity of symptoms. If symptoms are less than twice a month, so we can manage it step one. If symptoms twice a month or more, but less than daily, step two, like that. These are just guidance, but there are other practical things as well. So, we cannot strictly adhere to these things, but just to have some idea and how to Thing we have to decide about the child's which child need which type of uh, treatment plan or uh, it should be done after assessing the overall picture, not only the frequency. But that is one of the important guidance, right? Uh, preschool asthma sometimes differ from school age asthma because preschool patients it's mainly neutrophilic mediated viral induced things. So because of that, uh, there's a little bit of different approach, and the older children six to twelve years. Again, little different approach plus uh, adolescents and adults, the approach is slightly different. So I'm not going to details because it's available in GINA and now the 2023 GINA report is also uh, available. They have released a few days ago. Uh, there are no major changes in 2023 one. There are some minor changes, some revisions and clarifications. But basically, important thing is diagnose asthma properly assess the, the uh, symptoms clinically, assess the possible steps they belong to and start treatment properly and review them frequently, assess, adjust and uh, 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 change the treatment accordingly. So that is the, the cycle which should continue till they achieve proper asthma control. So that's the most important thing and most important uh, message I am going to give throughout my presentation today. As I mentioned, adults and older children, the approach is a little different and other important thing is this smart therapy use of inhaler corticoid switch plus four meterol containing uh, inhalers as reliever as well as the uh, the maintenance therapy or control the mart is maintenance and uh, reliever therapy and uh, sc is also there sometimes they use smart smart is single maintenance and reliever therapy using a single inhaler sit single inhale therapy using single inhaler as uh, the controller as well as a reliever. As we know, the, our usual approach is to use some inhaler, maybe uh, uh, beclomidazone or something, uh, steroid only inhaler, or some combined inhaler like pruticosone uh, for a cell metrol. Uh, and while going on, when the child develops symptoms, we add salbutamol containing inhaler. Uh, that's a usual approach. But this approach, Formatrol containing inhaler, we can use the same inhaler, increase the frequency. Uh, if we uh, give uh, two puff twice a day, we can increase it to two puff four times a day, like uh, instead of using salbutamol inhaler. That's a smart approach, and that is mainly recommended for children over 12 years of, uh, and even uh, as a second option in children over uh, six years of age. So, here the important thing I have to stress is it's only with formatrol. We cannot do this with salmeterol containing inhalers because formeterol the although it's a long acting bronchodilator agent onset of action of formeterol is almost similar to the onset of action of salbutamol that's why we can use formeterol as a relief as well because the response is very quick actually it start within five minutes after giving uh, inhaler almost comparative to the salbutamol inhaler
so smart uh, we are using this thing and so it's mainly adults and adults and over the uh, 12 years step 3 it's recommended by gene as a first line treatment there are many many evidence accumulating who support uh, this approach as well as uh, children older than 6 years it is it can be used at an as an alternative approach okay so this is the initial treatment initial approach how to identify a proper step and you have to start treatment properly and then the maintenance of treatment so maintenance is the most important thing to achieve the control whereas this is a chronic disease we cannot stop this within one or two encounter till the inflammation is persisting child might develop symptoms if we do not treat properly so we no can no one cannot predict how long this inflammation persists that means how long will disease will this disease persist most of the time the one of the major question from parents is doctor how long this will persist uh, how how long do you recommend to use this uh, inhaler especially there is uh, obviously there are a lot of myths about inhalers in our setups now so then still some parents are very very reluctant to start uh, inhalers in their children so because of that uh, the one of the important questions but obviously you have to stress is all depend on the inflammation inflammation changes in the airways we cannot tell we cannot see inside but we are using this maintenance treatment and approach uh, reviewing and depend on the clinical response we are uh, going up or down along the stepwise approach plan so that's the important thing if there is uh, all depend on because genes most of the time plus the cause of that allergy as well as environment triggers we, which we cannot predict okay so an important thing in this step uh, the maintenance of treatments we have to use, uh, check again uh, whether this child is using an appropriate drug in her corticosteroid short acting bronchodilator agents long acting bronchodilator agents long acting anti muscarinic agents and some add on drugs like uh, montelukast and adherence to treatment is one of the key factor i'll discuss it later and then we can think whether we can we should step down or step up or maintain with the same uh, level of treatment like that in this stepwise approach we can step up appropriately if symptoms are uh, uncontrolled or uh, despite good adherence to treatment so first thing is we have to make sure the patient is using this inhaler properly uh, regularly if that is the case still if the symptoms are persisting then we can consider going up in the steps or adding some uh, appropriate drug if the symptoms are controlled then we can step down we can reduce the drugs gradually one by one so that is important then with this inhaler technique is one of the most important because one of the most important i uh, uh, the method of giving drugs is the inhaler because through the inhaler we are giving drugs directly into their breathing tubes it is just like uh, uh, putting some eye drops uh, if the child is or a patient is having an eye disease and as you know usually we don't use tablets or syrup for eye diseases because the affected organ is there we can directly put drugs into the affected organ so this is also same there's a method very nicely we can directly put the drugs into the place where the disease is so for that we are using two methods one thing is nebulization one thing is going through the inhaler inhaler would be puffer a capsule or the dry powder inhaler but whatever the method the approach is to give in the drug directly into the site of disease that's the beauty of that with that the dose the amount of drugs we are using is very very minimum rather than using the oral route plus the action is fast because we are directly giving it to the place where the problem is so these are the things you should stress to the patients especially parents ask doctor uh, why you are using inhaler can, can't can't use uh, uh, tablets or syrup for my child's treatments so uh, with the pathophysiology you have to in, uh, adequately educate the parents and usually i'm asking the thing is the other way uh, in other countries the parents question is doctor why can't you start an inhaler why do you give my child these tablets that level should achieve in our country as well because still we have various myths regarding this inhaler technique okay so as i mentioned it's just a topical ap application of drugs and low dose and because of that we are using inhalers and the side defects are less so we are using this uh, uh, inhaler however using inhaler the drawback is 
we have to use it properly. Otherwise, the drug which reaches the lung, so lung deposition, it will significantly reduce. It's not a simple process. Just taking inhale and pressing it won't give rise to lung deposition significant amount. So that's the most important thing you have to remember starting before starting an inhale because it's a complex process. I'll show it and uh, depend on the, it's depend on the type of device, aerosol formulation as well as patient's inhalation technique. All these things are important because finally what the matter is the lung deposition amount of particles or the percentage of particle which finally deposit in the lung that's important otherwise if we just deposit in the throat or the major ways obviously asthma control would be poor because the drug hasn't reached reached the place where the problem is especially the small airways most of the time this air flow limitation is at the small airways because the uh, significant amount of airway resistance is driven by this inflamed small layers okay well, uh, this uh, 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 the, uh, it's important about the subparticle size i'm not going to the details but just to illustrate to it's not a simple process just to illustrate you know, the importance of the inhaler technique right so the for that the aerodynamic diameter is uh, uh, the important in the that's a simply particle size and the particles are deposited, uh, particles in these inhalers are deposited in the lungs with three mechanisms, impaction, sedimentation and diffusion because the problem is the airway, it's divide, 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 divide. So it's dividing up to about 23 times till it become uh, the alveoli. So it's dividing branching uh, network. So because of that, uh, if we do not use it a proper techniques, most of the time is hit on the the carina level and the secondary tertiary and the rest of the carina and it won't go into the into the inside the airway. So obviously this is some branching thing now, right? And here, so the the larger particles deposited within this, especially the more than ten micrometer diameter particles deposited in the pharynx and then. Uh, Another particle, especially the most important size, is the one to three like thing, and then they have to go up to the smaller air waste, right? Okay, so this is important. So I would like to pay your attention for this graph. Uh, if we use it only with the MDI or the actual the lung deposition, if we do not use with the proper inhaler technique, the lung deposition would be about five percent. The 95% of the time it deposit within the uh, uh, pharynx and it's swallowed and finally give rise to side defects. Or oh, that is the one which uh, enter into a systemic circulation. So that's why it's important. If you do not use the inhaler correctly, only 5% will read the lung. 95% uh, through the pharynx absorb, uh, swallow and absorb into the bloodstream. And that's the portion which give rise to systemic side defects. So in correct inhaler techniques, not only improve the lung deposition and that reduce the side defects as well. So that is very important to stress. Okay, so what is the best long term method for drug delivery into the system, right? Into the small layer. So this is a very nice graph summarizing all the uh, studies done up to now. You can see uh, this is the pressurized MDI alone. And this is the lung deposition fraction, uh, just relative fraction. And this um, brown color column indicate the oropharyngeal deposition. Uh, this uh, device the amount of fraction de de deposit in the device represented by the uh, green color uh, bar and the lung deposition. The, what is the most important thing is the uh, that is represented by this blue color. Uh, bar. Okay, so our aim is to reduce the oropharyngeal deposition as much as possible or the, the brown column, the reduce the brown column, height of this brown column as much as possible and increase the height of the lung deposition or the uh, blue column. Okay, so if you use MDI alone, just uh, keep it in the mouth and pressing it, you can see significant proportion stay in the pharynx and this is the proportion which soloed and give rise to systemic absorption and side defects. Only a small proportion, less than 10% deposit in the lung or reach the lung. 
and if we uh, so i'm not going to all the things you can compare but so this is a important thing if we use uh, ndi with the spacer or the valve holding chamber this unwanted fraction this is the deposit fraction deposit in the uh, uh, the device unwanted fraction the brown thing which deposit in the pharynx which are uh, deposit in the spacer so simply the side defects are going to the spacer who okay. care but most important thing is the lung deposition okay so lung deposition is maximum with uh, mdi and the uh, uh, spacer if you use dp inhaler again same we might have a little bit uh, more lung deposition in comparison to the mdi alone but the problem is the significant amount of uh, pharyngeal deposition is there that means significant amount of side defects are there so even the child can manage with the dpi inhaler that's why we do not encourage them to use that because of this significant pharyngeal deposition so the best method is to use a spacer plus a mdi so that's a method which has been proven with studies okay so again i can show it with the real study you can see it so this is a, a, a picture mdi alone you can you, you see with i'll show a very clear thing like there are many studies uh, go you can see here with the space uh, without the spacer uh, mdi alone significant amount of uh, proportion are in the uh, pharynx and this study is very clearly show this is the pharynx without the spacer uh, and significant amount in the pharynx as well as the particles number of particles this is done with using technetium 99 label particles or the mdi sprays and the lung deposits are minimum but significant amount of uh, particles are deposit or the uh, uh, solute and it's in the, they are in the stomach okay but if we use a space uh, you can see the unwanted fraction which is deposited in the pharynx has reduced and now it is deposited in the uh, space uh, but most important thing is lung deposition has improved okay so that's why various studies have proven that uh, even with graphically uh, with the picture clearly uh, use of mdi is an important thing with the spacer so even the child can manage without the spacer don't encourage to use this thing it should be always your discourage should be mdi plus spacer so if a child is small child we can use a spacer plus face mask if the child is older child we can use without the face mask that's also important as soon as possible if they can manage without the face mask with the uh, with the mouthpiece we have to uh, ask them to use without the face mask because when they using with the face mask if we inhale through the nasal road the nasal passage the nasal cavity is naturally formed to prevent the small particles entering into the body or into the lungs like um, uh, dust particles and they keep them in the pharynx with the action of the uh, cilia and then solo so simply the nasal cavity prevent uh, uh, the passage of small particles dust particles into the lungs so the same thing can happen to the same mechanism applier same thing can happen to the uh, in, inhaler particles as well so because of that as soon as possible we have to bypass the nasal cavity that's why it's important to use the oral route as soon as possible if the child can manage but small children no options we have to use a spacer with the face mask there, is, there are various types of spaces are there uh, in the market so the, there are no comparative one-to-one -one studies but anything can be used there are various properties how do we uh, select how oh, the the inhaler technique so this is i'm not going to details but just uh, give a few uh, a quick uh, uh, outline about the inhaler techniques first thing is we have to shake the inhaler because inside the uh, mdi it's contained the liquid liquid propellant as well as a gas the gas amount is about 20 milliliter but drug is just one milliliter 0 0.5 to one milliliter if you don't shake it's only the propellant gas will read the lung not the drug right and it's always have to keep the upright position because the mechanism is coming like this and if you keep other sides the drug get uh stagnant in the other way so obviously it won't reach the or it won't release and obviously you have to have a uh, obvious uh, tight uh, seal and you have to activate only once uh, still we see uh, if we want to give pop-ups straight away the 
uh, the parents press all the four puffs together. That shouldn't be done. That's a nice study. They have identified this is the amount of uh, lung deposition with one press, one activation, two activation, and three activation together. You can see very nicely with three activation together. So if, if the purpose is to get three times of deposition of rather than giving one thing, you have you can see actually it has reduced more than one puff. So why what it's happened? Because uh, when you give all the three or four together into a the small space, uh, the small particles become larger particles. They uh, group together and deposit within the pharynx as well as the spacer so then the total lung deposition would be uh, lower than even using single so always press one at the once and then inhale without a delay more the delay particles deposit in the space and the amount of lung deposition would be less and you have to take deep so slow breaths deep slow slow and steady breath five to six breath in a small children they are when they are using the tidal breathing techniques if they use like this, there's sometimes the uh, uh, the spacer, uh, there's a whistling sound. Whistling sound indicate inhaler technique is incorrect. They should use, uh, they should take a slow and steady breath. That is to get the lamina flow. If they do like this, take a far harsh breath, the breath become turbulent and hit on the pharynx and major airways, won't reach the distal airway. And they have to uh, hold the breath for five to 10 seconds if possible. That is to increase the sedimentation of the deposition. And if you want to give uh, the next puff, wait about 30 seconds and then again shake it and give it. That's the way. So you have to give separately with about 30 seconds gap. The 30 second gap is important because it's in, inside the canister. It's the pressurized gas in the minus 30 degrees Celsius. When it's going through the small hole, the minus 30 uh, air, it becomes shrink and then when we uh, give the next puff straight away the dose which coming through the shrink the small hole would be reduced so again you have to allow it to become the room temperature that's why you have to wait about that so all these steps have all these um, uh, the method that we are advising have some purpose due to some physiological thing that's why you have to follow the exactly same method and after obviously if you are using the uh, steroid inhaler rinse the mouth after using the steroid inhaler so those are the important thing and uh, for inhaler technique up to three to four years we have to use the face mask another thing is if the baby is crying don't give it because crying means expiration crying means expiration expiration and they take the quick breath right so the the exactly uh, opposite thing what we exactly what so don't encourage uh, you use inhalers if the baby is crying usually our setup uh, the baby is hold by three to four people grandparents and the, they keep the face mask tight and somehow try to hold this but that shouldn't be done because the lung deposition would be significantly low if that's the case then they can uh, 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 advise the parents to use while the child is sleeping and five to six breath would be enough no need to keep 10 times 20 times one minute two minutes till we see just five to six breath would be enough with that tidal breaks all the content with that space uh, should go into the lung after that whatever the time it there's nothing inside right so other important thing is when you are when we want to achieve the asthma control so that while stressing while you are knowing the correct techniques you have to in, advise the parents regarding the inhaler techniques you have to advise what is what should they do other important things demonstrate demonstrate using the real uh, space and the uh, uh, mdi demonstrate how do they use and always check regularly each encounter you have to check it whatever the things whatever our advice whatever our knowledge sometimes the transmission of that to the patients might be a little bit low and the understanding of patient might be low whatever the method to use but still you have to regularly check whether your method your instructions are followed by them so regular checkup is very very important about the inhaler technique then so these are the important steps we can use and sometimes there are some uh, non formal measures also uh, uh, some of the practically might not be possible but there are various things important thing is uh, avoidance of potential allergen that is important thing so if the child has identified there is a potential especially like um, uh, smoking smoking is very easy to uh, if the parents want 
very easy to stop because that is not an essential thing like that addressing the triggers are also important especially if they have uncontrolled disease but at the same time other important thing we have to stress is in our setup sri lanka various restrictions are there with foods uh, say example uh, eggs fruits uh, dairy products all the children so obviously all these factors are not important for all children all these factors are not trigger for all the children so because of that we should not advise to avoid all these things if the child or parents has identified a very clear association with exposure some food or some environmental thing they can avoid that thing but otherwise no need to restrict their activities so we want to restrict or control the disease but not to control the child or their activities okay so obviously we other measures we can uh, follow our improve physical activities another thing is comorbid factors comorbidities sometimes uh, it's like example obesity allergic rhinitis reflux and sometimes obstructive sleep apnea these are the conditions might coexisting with asthma and those conditions might lead to uncontrolled symptoms especially obesity obesity induced asthma sometimes very very difficult to treat or very difficult to manage because their pathophysiological processes are different that's the thing sometimes if the patient can reduce reduce weight without an inhaler that might be the only effective intervention even without inhaler they can achieve asthma control like that addressing the comorbidities are important if they have significant reflux we have to treat with anti reflux measures then the follow up is very important again same thing while follow up uh, uh, we have to assess symptom control and risk for future exacerbation especially if you want to uh, step down and this is the way we assess the control we don't use much of the things only four things we are using daytime asthma symptoms a night time waking and use of uh, uh inhaler and the activity limitations we depend on these four clinics this is according to gina and we assess over the control over the last four weeks depend on that uh, we can categorize them well controlled partially controlled and poorly controlled asthma very simple four features we are using right then if they have uncontrolled symptoms the final thing is addressing the uncontrolled symptoms that is mainly at step four and five i'm not going to the details of this thing so then that's the actual area the difficult to control asthma or severe therapy resistant asthma uncontrolled symptoms there is a group which difficult to control asthma they are having persistent symptoms actually that is due to some other reasons maybe poor compliance maybe poor adherence maybe poor uh, inhaler techniques maybe inadequate doses or maybe simply they don't have money to buy inhalers like in our setup these days uh, uh, or some environmental factors triggers but still symptoms are uncontrolled so that is again part of difficult to control asthma but the true severe therapy resistant asthma proportion is very very minimum actually it may be less than 1% but most of the time other factors children with uncontrolled symptoms we can address properly okay so obviously check the diagnosis is correct inhaler technique drug doses and address the exacerbating factors special environment exposures tobacco uh, uh other fumes some other environmental uh, allergens air allergens maybe house dust mite pet and animal dander cockroaches moles so we have to address all these things we have to directly question about uh, these possible uh, uh, triggering factors if the child's symptoms are uncontrolled sometimes in uncontrolled children we might do skin prick test or allergen uh, check the specific ig test but that is also important i want to stress this also if this allergen testing we should be done if the child's symptoms are uncontrolled only sometimes we see it's the first step just diagnosis with asthma start with uh, doing this uh, allergen testing is no point of this most of the time they are symptoms they might have some allergy to house dust mite how can we control house dust mite it's everywhere so like that so most important thing is start a proper treatment course and going on with the course if that with that also if the symptoms are going on then we have to do some fine adjustments and some other further investigations not as the initial steps and obviously as i discussed we have to address the other things if the symptoms are there persistent symptoms with comorbidities obesity reflux sometimes there might be complicated cases like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis which lead into uncontrolled symptoms there are some advanced steps uh, uh, uh this is a uh, condition allergic conditions which lead into uncontrolled symptoms in a child with 
background asthma, uh, ABPA, and severe asthma, the new trends are to assess the uh, fractional exhaled uh, uh, nitric oxide that is called pheno, because nitric oxide acts as a surrogate mark of ARV inflammation, eosinophilic ARV inflammation. If the ARV inflammation is more, Pheno levels are high, that high pheno levels are indicate with child is having significant airway inflammation because we cannot see inside the airways. So these are the things we can see inside through the pheno level. That's a surrogate mark. Even we can use the sputum level. So this is a uh, pheno assessment, or even we can use a sputum, uh, sputum uh, inflammation assessment of sputum. Eosinophils levels, these are still at the research level, but the pheno is available, uh, but not widely available in Sri Lanka also. And other way, step down. When the symptoms are controlled, we can step down. It's mainly symptoms control more than three months, as well as respect. There are no risk factors for exacerbation. Sometimes child symptoms might be trying to have very good symptom control, but still child might have risk factors for exacerbation so because of that you have to consider both otherwise again once we stop or once we step down again child might present with an exacerbation so to consider stepping down there should be symptom control fully controlled symptoms at least three months so that means we have to continue these uh, managements for uh, some significant amount of time because the inflammation in asthma is a persistent thing little long-term thing we cannot do it in a hurry within few weeks or within few months in most of the children okay there are various risk factors for exacerbation so we have to address these things if we have to make sure these risk factors are not there before considering stepping down or stepping uh, 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 or stopping treatment right so it is very important to consider is this the correct time to step step down and then we can gradually step add-ons like if the child is on leukotrains we can first reduce the montelukas dose and then can continue with inhaler steroids and then we can gradually reduce the inhaler corticosteroid dose by 25 to 50 percent at a time and it should be a slow process and continuous follow-up and assessment and adjustment of treatment is important and finally acute attacks i'm not going to the details of the management of acute attack but just to want to show one thing uh, if a child present with acute attack obviously we have to assess the child and we have to categorize whether it's a mild moderate or severe disease according to that we have to uh, uh, manage the child especially it's important to identify life-threatening asthma features of life-threatening like silent chest cyanosis poor respiratory report or bradycardia like this thing according to that there are uh, various algorithms we can use uh, bronchodilate agents back-to-back -back nebulization so even continuous nebulization sometimes with uh, obviously we have to use steroids or a low iv steroids plus uh, sometimes in severe cases we have to use maybe infusions magnesium sulfate uh, iv salbutamol or iv aminophil so with that management uh, i want to stress is this so zero tolerance to asthma attacks when we have when we face a child with acute asthma attack while on treatment so we have to use this asthma attack as a fact finding mission to identify what was the reason this child develop a attack develop an attack if the child is goes on proper treatment whether it's due to inadequate dose whether it's due to poor technique poor adherent environmental factors viral infections cigarette smoking by the father all these things are important to prevent future just before discharge rather than just uh, controlling acute attack and treating acute attack and discharging child home before discharge we have to think or assess the reason for these exacerbations and we have to address these factors before the discharge in time that is one of the important thing so they have uh, especially the Dancet commission in 2017 they have uh, I, they have a recommend to use the term attack asthma lung attack uh, rather than using asthma exacerbations because it's it's for english literature obviously but our setup also because our people are familiar with heart attack heart attack means alarming thing they know this is there's a problem similar way now rather than using the term asthma exacerbations so they for this layman also they recommend to use the term asthma lung attack it's similar as like heart attack to get more uh, uh, give some gravity more gravity to do this problem okay so finishing all these things in the management we discuss to control the disease so we mainly uh, the, once the child develop 
uh, asthma. So mainly we uh, focus about the symptom control, but still there is no method to prevent the disease, especially before developing the disease. In the future, there are some studies are going on developing targeted in future, especially biomarkers to identify potential candidates who can develop asthma and then uh, uh, starting some treatment course. So modifying these uh, uh, processes to prevent development of asthma, the primary prevention, which is not possible at the moment. Other thing is asthma cure. All these methods we are using inhales, cortical suite and all these things, we just control the disease, but there are no method to cure the disease at the moment. But future, there are studies going on. How can we alter or change the pathophysiological mechanisms to cure the disease or disease modifying approach? These are the future till that we have to follow the methods that I have discussed to achieve the asthma control. So primary prevention or cure for asthma, we a long process. Sometimes we might not live uh, when the world recognize or identify or invent that process. But till that, asthma control, we have to go slowly, uh, proper assessment, proper diagnosis, proper use of medications, regular follow-up, inhaler technique, all these things are very important to achieve asthma control in children. So in summary, asthma is a leading cause of childhood morbidity and even mortality. Still children are dying due to asthma and control symptoms. So if you want to get a proper asthma control, so correct diagnosis is important and identify possible phenotypes and individualized approach is important in the management and appropriate pharmacological management, correct use of drugs inhalers. So long-term maintenance treatment is important as it is a chronic disease. It's a chronic disease. Inhaler technique, addressing the proper inhaler techniques and if possible, some non-pharmacological measures, regular follow-up, frequently assessing and adjusting the treatment plan and addressing the uncontrolled symptoms, especially addressing the triggers and especially when they coming with uncontrolled symptoms or acute attack, converting an acute attack as a fact-finding mission to prevent further episodes. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any question, I can um, answer. There's a question, contraindications for Montelukas. Uh, basically, in our practical setup, there are no major contraindications for Montelukas. As you know, Montelukas, now there's a black box warning. Um, it can cause some neuropsychiatric symptoms. If there is any history of any such thing or any allergy, major allergy, it's a contraindication. But practical setup, uh, basically, unless there's a specific allergy, there's no basic contraindications because it's again um, antagonist in the leukotriene pathway. You know? So it's very usually it does not cause significant allergic reactions. So basically, there's no major contraindications. After six months of age, is recommended to use. But the thing is, um, the effect. Most of the time we are using Montelukas, but um, uh, at the time of invention of this Montelukas, there were a lot of hopes about this drug. But now it seems to be does not work that much. Sometimes we are using still as a monotherapy or some short courses, one or two weeks of Montelukas doesn't work. But uh, most of the time, I'm also still seeing uh, for acute uh, causes, acute exacerbations, one or two weeks of maybe even five days of Montelukas doesn't work. So if it is there, we have to use for, we have to go for uh, steroids. Right? So basically, there's no major in practical important contraindication for Montelukas. But the thing is, we have to be very sure that it is indicated because most of the time it doesn't work. I thank uh, Dr. Chandra De Silva for his uh, very informative lecture today. Uh, sir, in the chat, there's one more question. Uh, is there a place for use of short-term inhaled corticosteroids for about one to two weeks, uh, duration following mild exacerbation? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, the, because asthma is an uh, inflammatory condition. So step one, the usual practices was to start give or just give bronchodilator agent only. And the accepted practice which are used in other countries is use the inhaler steroid, inhaler uh, bronchodilator agents. And most of the Western countries now the salbutamol syrups are not available, syrups or tablets. It's only the inhale salbutamol is available. So the step one, intermittent uh, infrequent episodes of wheezing, mild to moderate. It's mainly our practices so just to give um, salbutamol only. But yes, now uh, Gina has identified because asthma is a implementary condition. So because of that, obviously you need for um, 
and to implement the medicines as well. So because of that, yes, there's a definite place and actually we should give it, especially children over six years of age and adults, adults and adults, even the first step, if they develop acute exacerbation, mild to moderate, ideal ways to manage with bronchodilator agents, inhale steroids, inhale, plus inhaler steroids, one or two week course of, usually two weeks course of, intermittent inhaled cortical steroids with bronchodilator agents for infrequent mild attacks, especially mild to moderated. Yes, there's a definite place. GINA is recommended in this since 2019. This is one of the major change in their GINA management guidelines. From the first step in the management, inhale cortical steroids short course is recommended. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question, a uh, very famous question we get our, in our pediatric practice daily. Uh, is there a place for use of salbutamol, either nebulization or oral in babies less than six months of age? Yes, yes. So the thing is, uh, the, the thing is, um, regarding this development of uh, receptors, the uh, beta-2 receptors, yes, it's a gradual process. So we cannot say at the birth, it is zero, and one year of age, it's 100%. So it's a gradual process. Obviously, there's no contraindication to use this uh, bronchodilatin salbutamol in small kids. Yes, we have to, we can use it, obviously. We can use it because it's a gradual process. The baby might have some uh, proportion of receptors for beta-2 agonists, and it might work. If it is not working, obviously, we can stop. And even current thing, and with Western literature also, there's no such a cutoff age to start salbutamol. Uh, so there's uh, one more question. Yeah, uh, yeah small beast less than six months or so we can use, but we have to make sure the indication. Most of the time, it is not the bronchospasm causing the problem. That's other thing. So we have to make sure that the indication is correct. If it is there, indication is there. Yes, we can use. Uh, so patient with uh, in, uh, sinus tachycardia, can we still nebulize with salbutamol or is there any other options? Uh, patient from James. Yeah. First thing is we have to make sure what is the reason for this tachycardia. Most of the time, tachycardia in uh, asthma, wheezing is due to hypoxia. Uh, so body is trying to generate more and more cardiac output to get more and more oxygen into the tissues. So that's the reason for tachycardia. So that type of situations, the management of asthma is the proper thing. If you manage asthma properly with bronchodilator, including salbutamol, actually heart rate gradually reduces. So don't afraid to use salbutamol, even there's a tachycardia. If child is having wheezing, so delay in giving or stopping or withholding bronchodilator, especially salbutamol, might further delay the process, might lead to persistent tachycardia. So unless there's no heart, heart problem, obvious arrhythmia, so if we see, actually we can continue and with proper treatment, gradually tachycardia will settle if it is due to hypoxia. So most of the time we are reluctant to <clears throat> continue salbutamol when there's a tachycardia is going on, but the problem is, Actually, the reason for the card is that. So then using salbutamol actually therapeutic might lead into reduction. Initially, there might be obviously a little bit increase, but always we have to monitor the child. While monitoring, we can continue proper management of asthma. That's, uh, that wraps up our uh, session today. Uh, our sincere thanks to Dr. Chanda De Silva, consultant pediatric pulmonologist at the Late Ridge Hospital for Children. Thank you, dear sir, for sharing your valuable wisdom and uh, spending your valuable time with us. And uh, I, on behalf of Sri and all the participants, I thank you again. And uh, all the participants, thank you very much uh, for joining this lecture. And please continue to join our CPD lectures conducted by Sri in the future as well. Uh, hope you all have a good day. Thank you.